please remember to uh, comment as we do on our regular platform. We want to engage with you. We thank GBH for making that possible. Um, we want to also welcome those that are here in the Java Cafe as well. As you know, on my regular um, platform, we engage, as I said, and we uh, look at the comments. And so please make sure you comment on YouTube and also on uh, YouTube as well. And if you are watching on javawithjimmy.com, you can comment there as well. Um, about today's show, we are talking about the wonderful history, the culture, um, the food, which is part of the culture, the contributions um, that Hispanic Americans and Latinx Americans have made to this country, made to Boston, made to Massachusetts, and to this region. And so we have three guests with us today in our first segment. We are going to talk with Jose Masso Sr. and also Migdalia Diaz. Um, and in, in the second segment, we get to talk with a good friend of mine, and it is Alberto Vasso, um, who I am honored to talk with all of my guests. But if you know Alberto, he is in media as well. And so we're going to talk with him in the second segment. But I would like to welcome my first two guests. Um, first is Jose Masso. He is the principal at JCM the Third Consulting LLC and a longtime host of a radio show called Consalsa. And I want to also name that I don't know if you took a break before the pandemic, but we enjoyed you coming back and seeing you spin during the pandemic. Um, also in our first segment is Migdalia Diaz. She is the Chief Operating Officer for Latinos for Education. And so please welcome both of them to the Java Cafe, and you can welcome them online as well. So Migdalia, I'd like to start with you because you move in this space of education. And as we are uh, both black and brown, we understand that there are a lot of disparities in health. Um, Post-COVID, post-George Floyd, we recognize a lot of disparities in this country for black and brown Americans. Um, can you give us sort of a, well, first of all, welcome to Java with Jimmy at GBH. Um, please introduce yourself, say hello, tell us a little bit about what you do, about what you do, and if you could give us a little scope of where are we with education when it comes to the Latinx community? Sure. <laughs> That's a lot there. That's, that's a lot. <laughs> um, so I, I'm actually fairly new to Latinos for Education. I'm super excited to be working with them. Uh, I've actually spent the past eight years predominantly focused on workforce, especially around Latinos. And in the past five and a half years, I've spent with the Commonwealth working at the Executive Office of Labor and Workforce Development. And one of the amazing things I learned there, because I had been so focused on workforce, was just really how you have to engage in all of the facets of the human existence when it comes to disparities. So I talk about um, the gap for bl our black and brown folks in terms of housing, in terms of education, workforce, health and human services, and really taking a holistic approach, which was something I, I'm so happy I got to learn at my time with the state. Um, and. And I also, you know, we were there during the pandemic and, and it, it really taught me a lot. I mean, I'm a COO, so I'm, I'm focused on how, to, how, do we, how do we achieve our mission operationally yep. uh, and being in a situation during the pandemic where our volume of services went up 2,000% in about two weeks. Wow. Um, we had to learn how to do that. And so I'm really excited to bring all of those uh, experiences and all of those skills to Latinos for education. Um, now, in terms of you know, where we are, I can tell you that across the country, we represent about 30, we're approaching 30% of students in okay. K through 12. Yep. Um, and in Massachusetts, in certain districts, that number is actually 40%. And we're seeing anywhere ranging, depending on where you look in the country, between 3 and 8% of educators actually being Latino. Repeat that. Between 3 and 8% of educators. Not 30, 3. Yeah, 3. 3, so we have, we have a great deal of work to do. Um, we actually have, and I, I think we may you know, talk about it a bit more later, but we have a bill that we're actually pushing forward in Massachusetts, the Educator Diversity uh, Act. Yep. Um, that can help us start to bridge some of those gaps by making sure that there's requirements around diversity in our schools. We're definitely going to come back to that and have a conversation about um, sort of some action items um, that we can do to help improve. I, I'm, I'm always about impact and action, um, and not just for Latinx or Hispanic um, um, parts of Massachusetts, but all of us need to 
uh, push that. So we'll talk about that in a second. Um, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'll be very honest and transparent. Um, we were um, able to uh, confirm our uh, male guest uh, uh, quite early. And I was very determined to have a, uh, a young woman represent the culture as well. And this was sort of a last minute ask. So McDowell, thank you so much for being here with us. Let's give her a hand um, as well. My good friend and brother, um, from a distance, mentor, example, you have moved in this space along with my uh, guests for the second segment. Um, you, um, I walked in this morning and, and looked at him and said, he's kind of low key today, but a, a, a fashion plate. Um, Jose, welcome to the Java Cafe, a Java with Jimmy here at uh, GBH. Please. For those that may not know who you are, please introduce yourself and tell us a little <laughs> bit about yourself. And I will ask you to end your introduction and I'll come back to uh, McDowell with this question as well. Describe Latinx or Hispanic culture or community with one word. Mm. I shall try to do that, Jimmy. <laughs> so first and foremost, thank you Absolutely. for this invitation and the honor of serving on this uh, a gust group of three panelists that you have invited to me is very special that we have this opportunity to tell our stories. You know, there's the African uh, proverb that says, until the lion tells the story of the hunt, the hunter will always be glorified. Yeah. So it's important for marginalized communities to be able to tell those stories. And so anytime we have an opportunity to be in front of a microphone, in front of people, uh, to be able to tell our stories is very important in my mind. And part of my drive to do what I've done for the last 50 years of my life since I've been in, in Boston since 1973 is to tell our stories, yes, right? And so my students, I taught right around the corner. So this is home for me. Okay. I'm on the board of the Boston Public Library's trustees. Uh, I taught high school right around the corner at Copley Square High School, which is now the Snowden International yes. School. It was my students who urged me and kicked me out of the classroom and told me you should do radio, do television, and say... I mean, you do have the voice. 40, well, maybe I do, but 48... <laughs> 48 years ago, I started on National Public Radio, WBR, doing Con Salsa every Saturday night. So I just celebrated my 48th anniversary. And I got the chance also to do television on Channel 5 um, after the uh, illustrious, uh, you know, Jorge Quiroga, who yes. hosted the Aki yes. Show, and then yes. he moved yes. on to do news. So I was able to do that as well. But I think, you know, going along the line of what you just started this conversation about is that if there's a key for us moving forward, and I'm 73 years old which means I have more past and future, more yesterdays and tomorrow. And the good thing about being at this stage is that I sleep well at night. And Jimmy, I'll tell you I sleep well at night because people like you, Dahlia, and others, your generation are the ones who are best equipped for all the challenges we're confronting at this moment as a society and as a country and as a world. Yes, sir. And all those issues go from climate change to racism to the disparities that we speak about and if there's anyone who can handle that and come up with the solutions, it's your generation. And so I sleep well at night, thanks to you. And so every morning when I wake up, I say, thank you, Lord, another day in which I can learn from you, but also be shoulder and shoulder to you yes, so sir. that we can you know, make this a better world. And so when you ask me to describe where we are in the sense of what does this mean for me, it's a moment of reflection. 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 Can you give me a little bit of context of, uh, to reflection? And Medallia, I'm, I'm going to ask you to get your word ready as well. I say that because, you know, the idea that we can celebrate who we are and uplift our ancestors yes. and our descendants in a month is really, you know, in the context of our daily lives, we celebrate who we are and where we come from every single day. Absolutely. Be it women be it the LGBTQ community, be it African Americans and blacks, be it whomever we are in this society, we celebrate who we are. And it's important, you know, um, Amir Suleiman has a poem, a spoken word that says, you will be someone's ancestor, act accordingly. And so I take that to heart, right? It's a spoken word. I take that to heart because I think that we need to always understand and reflect what we're doing every single day that's gonna impact seven generations from now. Mm. How our children's children are gonna live. And so, as someone from our community that is proud of our roots, you know, I come from a very proud 
family of African descendants from Puerto Rico, the archipelago of Puerto Rico, because it's not just Puerto Rico, the island. Puerto Rico is also the island of uh, Old San Juan, it's Vieques, it's Culebra, it's Mona. We're a combination of islands that make up the archipelago. We think about Puerto Rico as just being one. It's those. So I come from a family of proud African descendants who our nationality is Puerto Rican, our ethnicity is Afro-Puerto Rican, our race is black, uh, our citizenship is that of the United States. And I know that these ancestors were the ones that paved the road for me to be able to do what I do. And at the same time, you introduced me as Jose Maso Sr. I'm not a senior, I'm the third. My father was Jose C. Maso, <clears throat> my brother Jose C. Maso II, I'm the third, and our son, who you know, yes. your generation, is Jose Fabio Maso on his own right. And so therefore, <laughs> I'm not a senior, I'm just the third, and he is Jose Fabio, who happens to be the chief of human services for the city of Boston. But I use that word reflection because every day we need to reflect and think, in my mind, this is my opinion, we have to think, what is our role every single day to better the future of our generation of children that are coming, and their children, and not just thinking from the perspective of the lens of being, you know, an Afro-Boricua and a member of the Latin community writ large, but the lens of human beings that connect because we're all connected one way or another. And so we need to reflect as to how we then move this world so there is a just society, so that we embrace diversity, so that we embrace equity, so we embrace, you know, inclusiveness in a way that everybody is at the table and that they can succeed in life. Absolutely. There's so much to unpack there. <clears throat> and though I'm appreciative of the time we have at GBH, there's, there, there's so much um, that we, we're trying to put in into our segment here. Um, McDowell, I wanted to ask you to also give a word um, for the culture, how you describe it. And then Jose talked about moving into action and moving the world. And I think that's a good opportunity to go back to the um, Educators of Diversity Act because with the information, with celebrating the culture, I would like folks to walk away with an action to continue to expand and build the culture. And, and Jose said reflection. Um, we want to reflect back a couple of years from now and say that this act is actually legislation. And so your word and then um, some about the legislation. And then we're going to get into a conversation about, because I do not want us to leave without the celebratory piece of all that comes with the culture. Yeah, I mean, I will say from the experience, I mean, I've had it in my own life, but also all the Latinos that I've met throughout the work, the word that comes to me is resilient. You know, there is, um, there has just been so many beautiful people in, from so many different countries, right? The Latino community is very diverse. Mm -hmm. And and hearing people's stories, and especially dealing with the, the families that we work with at Latinos for Education, that is really the one thing that comes across consistently, yes. is this resiliency uh, to really create a path forward and create a better future for our community. It's, it's interesting, because I, I told you this was an authentic, um, um, organic space, and that word resilience, I often struggle with, because we become resilient mm. by constantly, constantly going through things that makes us resilient, and so while it's a good thing to get us forward, how we become resilient is the past few years just been something that's pondering around in my mind. Um, one of the viewers, Jose, wants to go back to your comment and say, our generation, yours, well, hers and yours, I know Pastor Marion, our generation built the foundation, now they can build on it. Yes. And so um, I just wanted to acknowledge Pastor Marion that's out there watching as well. And so Migdalia, that piece about resilience, Fold that into this, the act that you are working on. Are, you said three to 8% of yeah. teachers, is that in Massachusetts, that are of Latinx or Hispanic descent? Yeah, so in Massachusetts, I believe it's 3%. 3%. Yeah. And so what does this act do to increase that? Tell us about the act. Yeah, so there is, it's, it's complex, but at a, at a high level. <laughs> Again, we can't do all of this in, in this time frame, but. But at, but at a high level, uh, it creates multiple pathways for people to become educators um, that will facilitate more folks of color actually becoming ed educators. Uh, it also raises the voices of uh, educators of color uh, by cre the creation of an educator council. And then it also creates a diversity dashboard at the state level in order to be able to track the progress of this work. 
Okay, so that, that definitely sounds amazing. Where is it? Is it, 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 it? Hopefully it's not oftentimes some of our legislation goes to committee, you know, for study and things like that. Where are we with this? Um, yeah. has it been, you can name the sponsors if you would like, and how are there action things that we can do to support it? Yeah, that is, that is a great question. Um, so we have about 60 legislative co-sponsors and about thousands of supporters. Um, we actually continue to work um, with the community and with the folks that kind of have the most vocal uh, organizations mm -hmm. to really get the word around. But we have a great support from the legislature already. Um, so as of right now, we're continuing to engage with the legislature and engage with, you know, different folks um, in the community. So it's, it's really just go to our website <laughs> for okay. latinosforeducation.org. Latinosforeducation.org. Um, Remember that. Yeah. Um, so we have a, a state of Latino education event that's happening next week. Um, and we have events that are kind of coming up where you can learn more about us and understand how to partake. We really approach the... Um, the idea of bridging the equity gap for educators and for students in multiple different ways. So it'd be great for folks to come and learn about our different programs and different ways to get engaged. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. We're getting ready to wrap up in this segment. I wanted to remind those of you that are here in the News Cafe and those of you that are also watching on Facebook and YouTube, the team is making sure I get your questions and comments. So if you have questions for either Jose or McDowell, please go ahead and ask them now. We have a few minutes left um, to chat with them. But as you're getting your questions together, let's get into the culture. Young people say, you know, for the culture and whatnot. Describe, and I'll start with you in this segment, Des as a Latina, describe your culture as, as, as passionately as, as whatever, describe the words, describe your culture. Yeah, I mean, honestly, it's, for me, it's centered around familia, and that also feeds into, like, the music and just the, the food and the language and what have you. Um, that's really just about togetherness. I mean, at the center of everything that I do with my friends and within my community, it's about rejoicing each other and, and celebrating together through music, through food, through connectivity, through, you know, whatever inspires us in that particular moment. And it's this... I, it's just joyous. It's, it's just it's, joyous. Yeah. You're almost all indescribable. It is. Because the it way you're sitting so here, it's like, I'm trying to find a word. And I know. It's, um, it's just, it really is pure joy, you know, and, okay. and having, having moments, too, where you have, where you see bits of our culture out in the community, whether it's food or music that's, you know, on mainstream radio, that's Spanish language. I mean, that, the, the sheer joy of feeling seen as a Latina in this country is is amazing. So for me, it's, it's really kind of a celebratory place where, that my community is in, where we're just celebrating each other through getting together. You should see your countenance as you're trying <laughs> to describe it. Um, I'm going to ask Jose, you talked about speaking the language. Um, Jose, you um, are very politically active, um, and you were a supporter of, of Mayor Wu. Um, and I need to ask you this, as McDalia talks about the language, we have a mayor who is of Asian descent, that often gets on camera and speaks Spanish. Yes. How does that make you feel? And then go into your, dis uh, your description as a Latino male. Um, first answer that question and then talk about your description. And we will highlight the book as well before sure. we take um, questions. Well, quickly, I will say, you know, having been a bilingual teacher and bilingual educator, Spanish and English was very important in the classroom yes. for me. I think it's important for all of us to be able to speak more than one language yes. if we're citizens of the world. And to have someone who we've known before she was... The, the mayor, and before she was a city, city councilor, councilor, and yep. when she was a lawyer and doing the work that she was doing, we understood that this was somebody very special. The first time I spoke to her, it was in Spanish on the phone, and I was like, who is this again? Did she and then call when you I met and her, start off in Spanish? Yes, and then when I met her in person, I went, wait a minute, say that again? <laughs> and so to have that, it was yes, because that made me understand how enlightened an individual she is, right? To yep. be able to understand that acquiring other languages very much makes you even much more accessible and have this uh, personal empathy, if you will, to the person with you're speaking with because there's a connection through language. And going to the piece about celebration, you know, I think, first of all, Latinos, we're not monolithic. And so what makes us so rich 
in our culture is that we're so diverse. We may have certain parts of our stories um, that are similar because the language and where we are, if we're from the Caribbean compared to being from Mexico or Central America or South America, it may be because some are from Brazil compared to being from you know ancestry that comes from Spain. But regardless, I think the one thing that I would add to the description of this celebration is, if anything you will find is that we celebrate life. We celebrate life to the umph degree. It is about the joy of living. It's the joy of living in multi-generational settings. So whenever we have something happening, it's not just this young generation who's celebrating. It's the multi-generation celebration of the abuelitas, the abuelos, las tias, the aunts, the uncles, the cousins, the neighbors, the little kids who are part of the celebration. And so when you say family, we're not talking about mom, dad, and son, and daughter. We're talking about all of us, and that includes community. And yes. so life is very much part of that, right? You're going to have that music. You're going to have that dance. You're going to have those pastimes that includes dominoes and everything else that has to do with it. And we celebrate life to the umph degree because we're in the present. We mm -hmm. are in the present. Regardless of what our past has been and whatever trials and tribulations, whatever triumphs we've had in the past, that present is the moment in which we are in real time with each other, giving the hug, giving the kiss, giving the joy, giving the laughter, crying sometimes when we cry, but it's always in the present. So I think that part of our culture is life. It's love. It's camaraderie. It's, you know, uno para todos y todos para uno, one for all and all for one, where we are more than happy to get the shirts off our back to the other person because we realize if they need that, we've got it, we will do that. So it's an ethos of community, it's an ethos of family, it's an ethos of life, love, of faith, because we are very much grounded in knowing that we're not here alone and that we are very much following the footsteps of ancestors and those giants, the person who said, we set the stage for you, I'm just following the giants before me, you know. And the celebration of some of our people, I have to mention Frida Garcia, Alex Rodriguez, just to mention two, right? And then we have to cross over. We have to mention the solidarity with people like Mal King yes. in this whole struggle, right? And so we do that because we understand that we're not here alone. And if it weren't for that solidarity with other ethnicities and groups, we would not be able to succeed. Jose, I, I, and we have to do this within um, um, 45 seconds, but this diaspora piece of the political power, I mm. just want to name that. We have a, a question from the audience, um, and I want to say hello to uh, Rena Francis and also uh, Miss Teresa, who's listening from out in Worcester. Um, but how you describe familia, how you describe, and joy, and how you describe, despite the struggles and whatnot, we still come back. I can sit here and say the same thing as a black man. Yes. The, the diaspora, when it comes particularly to political power, to getting this legislation across the line, can for the next, and y'all tell me exactly how many minutes I got, for the next, like, two minutes or whatever, one minute, Howard, please, uh, I got uh, two minutes, for the, so a minute each, diaspora, political power, what do you say to that? I think we have... A long way to go. You know, I think there's, um, I think we, we are seeing more representation. I think yes. finding avenues in which we can, you know, educate our Latino community in yep. terms of like, how do you get there? Yep. You know, and how do you, how do you kind of maneuver through that? Um, we do, we are really active with it in Washington and Massachusetts and in Houston and San Francisco as well, where, where Florida. we are. Sorry? Florida. Not, not yet. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> um, but, you know, we, we're very active within those communities, and yeah. we certainly have allies that we found that, that are listening. Um, but I, I honestly think that in the long run, if we, can, if we can educate Latinos as to how to get in there so that we have more representation yes. in government, um, I think will be key. In terms of making progress. Absolutely. Thank you. And I hate to, hate to cut you off. Jose, particularly in Boston, and I know you can speak to national as well, yeah. across the diaspora, our political power, we're in an election, mid-municipal yeah. election, we got like 30 seconds you before got Howard Where we were 50 years ago and where we are today is, you know, night and day, but it doesn't mean we've reached where we want to reach. And by that, what I'm saying is we've done much better in using our political agency and our civic engagement in ways that move the agenda and the policies that impact not only Latinos, but the BIPOC community, the way people identify. And therefore, I will repeat one of the important things and the lessons I think that we've learned as activists is that we cannot do this alone. If I were just doing 
doing this as a Puerto Rican, I will get nowhere. I've got to bring in all the other sectors of the Latin diaspora into this mix. I have an advantage as a Puerto Rican that I'm a U.S. citizen, so therefore I don't have to go through a visa and have to go through a green card and have to apply for citizenship. So therefore I have a voice and I have a platform and I have agency. But I want to make sure that those that don't have voices are allied with where we want to go. And at the same time, I want to make sure that we work in solidarity with other groups African Americans, Asian Americans, progressive whites, in making sure that agenda at the end, what we're looking for is equity, inclusion, and diversity. And it's important for us to be civically engaged in whatever aspect we can be, to be educated, to be informed, to make the decisions that ultimately will lead to what I just said. Jose and Magdalia, thank you both. Let's give them a hand um, as we get ready to um, transition to our second segment. I want to thank you, Magdalia. There was a question from the audience, and I can connect you and Pastor Marion. Would like, she would like to know if you provide resources for um, young Spanish-speaking women, and so I'll make sure we connect um, the both of you. Thank both of you for being here, and I really appreciate it. Let's give them a hand again. I am so excited. Thank you. Thank you. I am delighted that both of them were able to be here with us. Don't forget, if you're watching on Facebook and on YouTube, you can ask questions and you can make comments. Um, and also here, if you're uh, in the audience and you have questions, you can write them down and see Annie, who's sitting there um, at the table waving her hand. You can give her questions as well. Um, and also, don't forget to fill out the card. Um, to, um, if you're asking a question, to fill out the card and give it to Annie, and then they'll call you up to come uh, to the microphone. I am just really excited today to make sure that we highlight Hispanic and Latino Heritage Month. I often, I joked with my guest a few minutes ago, often sometimes because of how I appear, um, I have been approached, and folks will come up and say, uh, tu habla espanol, and I say, se habla espanol en muy, muy, Poquito. And it's so important, not just with Hispanic culture, and we celebrate Black History Month and other cultures and celebrate Women's History Month and things like that. These months are being highlighted because these are typically populations and groups that have been marginalized. And so either through government or through community advocacy, we have these months, Black History Month, Women's History Month, Hispanic Heritage Month. We have June and the summer where we talk about the LGBTQ plus community. And so it's important that we celebrate these months and we continue to highlight the, the contributions that all of these groups have made to our country. One of the things that McDowell talked about was the importance of participating in different sectors. Um, I am honored to have Jose that is a media type, he was an educator, and we didn't get a chance to talk about his book that's coming out, but check my website or, or my Facebook page in a few days and we'll have information about that. But one of the places that, um, and I have to pause and say I appreciate WGBH for allowing me to be able to come here, a community voice who is a uh, black gay male to be able to come here and talk about community issues. And so even in the media, it is important that we have representation as well across from Latin, black, women, LGBTQ+, of Asian descent, and other marginalized communities. It is vitally important that we have that representation. And so I am so excited um, that in our next segment, I get to speak with someone who is a mentor. I know he would shy away from, and I don't use this, I hardly ever use this word because I grew up in church, and, um, but kind of like an idol, um, because I've seen him throughout the years be present in community. Um, and anytime when I started this platform, and even before when I was with Mayor Menino, um, Alberto has been someone that has always been encouraging and setting an example. He has, with Java with Jimmy, we have a segment called Your Healthy Java. I'm not going to mess up and try to say what his health segment um, is called, and he'll tell me in a few minutes. But I am so excited today, and I want to ask my audience to put their hands together. And those of you that are at home that are usually in the Java Cafe, put the clapping hands up in the comments as well. And welcome Alberto Vasso III to Java with Jimmy here at GBH. Wow, I, I, I love the applause. I actually was expecting a standing ovation, but that's all right, everybody. That's all right. I'm just kidding, Jimmy. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so in my last yeah. segment, I had a young brother here, DL. We kind of played off each other, and it was an interesting dynamic. I think this one is yeah. going to be as well, but differently, because I have to honor you. You 
like I said with Jose, like I'm from afar. I've admired you since this platform has started. You've shared tech information with me. You had me out at Fenway Park with you and Dante yeah. interviewing folks at the event there. So I have to thank you, but let me back up a little bit and ask you, for those of you who may, just may not know who you are and what you do, please introduce yourself. Okay, great. Uh, my name is Al Alberto Vasallo, Mr. Boston. No, I'm not kidding. I gave, I gave that like years ago as, as a youngster, but um, so my, my life history is all about Boston. I was born in Boston City Hospital. I grew up here. I went to school. I'm a triple legal, BC High, Boston College. Uh, <laughs> got, got three of those. Um, but I worked uh, at WHDH uh, for Urban Update for 27 years, hosting and producing at Channel 7. Um, obviously working with the Boston Red Sox since I was 13 years old. So uh, when I started working with the Red Sox, all the baseball players were like, 10 years older than me. I mean, older. Now, they're all 30 years younger than me. Um, so, you know, it's been a long time um, at Fenway. Um, and I've grown up in the city. My life has been media. Like I said, I've worked at Channel 7. El Mundo Boston's in my DNA. Uh, and El Mundo Boston has helped me, uh, has helped us put together major events. So just last week, we had this, uh, I call, it's called the Hispanic Heritage Breakfast. Yes. I stole that from the Irish. Because you know how the Irish have the St. Patrick's March Day? The, yes, over, yes. This one's yep. funnier and better, right? So I get to roast, I got to roast um, this year, all women. Because, you know, the state of Massachusetts is being run by women. It is. You've got... And I'm not mad at it No, uh, you've got a governor, vice governor, uh, attorney, attorney general, general, auditor, uh, treasurer. Think about it. Mayor of Boston. Yeah. And it's okay. about time they started working. That was, the, that was the line. See, oh, that you're going to get, get us in trouble, but that no, was the joke at the breakfast. That was okay, the joke, okay. but then I said, but then I said, remember, behind every great man, there's a woman rolling her eyes, knowing she can do it better. So that was, I kind of... And the women are in here. Oh, they were <laughs> oh we got fine, applause right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, so I have a lot of fun in my job. Yes, we do. Um, we have a great partnership with the Red Sox. Fenway Park is my second home. Um, but being in front of a camera has kind of been something um, that we do. And now every day, I'm up at 5 in the morning. We do this uh, live broadcast called La Hora del Café, the coffee hour. It's brought me back to my roots. Uh, doing it in Spanish, mm -hmm. so I'm kind of one of those hybrids that I don't know what's better, my English or my Spanish, because I grew up simultaneously mm -hmm. learning both languages. Um, obviously, being born in Boston, but being but growing up in a Hispanic household, I had that kind of dual uh, bringing up, you know, home uh, Spanish at home, yep. and then obviously English everywhere else. So La Hora del Café lets me go back to my Spanish. And I always start off the audience and say, my Spanish isn't as perfect as, as you know, a foreign, a native one, but it's pretty good. So uh, we do this morning show called The Coffee Hour, and uh, the guests that we get on range from Big Poppy to Mayor Wu, to the governor, to so Jimmy Wajava soon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm excited about that. But one of your guests that you have is Dr. Betancourt. Dr. Through that, Betancourt. through that relationship with MGH. And so that may be a good segue, because I want to end with the culture yeah. on a good note. But because you're in media, because you're um, 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 invested in the city and, and so um, just ingrained in community, I want to ask you if you were to give a perspective around either health, education, the whole sort of um, quality of life perspective of, and let's keep it local, the Hispanic or Latinx uh, communities here in Boston, how would you describe the quality of life in one word? And I'm working with you to get one word out of you is going to be interesting. Uh, two words. Then. <laughs> See, right, I told you. Two. <laughs> Endless opportunities. Endless opportunities. Okay. I like the perspective of that, and thank you for that, because one would presume that it maybe have a negative connotation. No. To it. We're not there. And so please no. give us context to the endless opportunities. Look, there are plenty of conversations that I've been a part of that are going on about the challenges and so forth. And I respect them and I participate in all of them. My spiel is always the future, okay? I know about the past. I think it's very important. But in my estimation, we need to have more conversations about the future, how we're going to work together. Well, how do we make this better together? Because we all have a vested interest. So when you talk about health and education, I say endless opportunities. You know, the, look at the course of the United States. In the next, it's all, the demographics are already written, right? Yeah. That train's left. We have to start educating on increasingly diverse populations. We have to level the playing fields. The, our future leaders are going to come from Roxbury. They're going to come from Mattapan. They're going to come from Dorchester. They're going to come from Lynn. They're going to come from Lawrence. And they're going to continue to come from West and Newton and so Chelsea forth. And, che but yep. Chelsea. So you've got a larger pool of people 
um, who are now fully Americans, who have their whole life vested in this country. And I think it's endless opportunities because just with that segment, every week we have a different doctor from one of the world's best hospitals yeah. speaking Spanish. That wasn't happening 20 years ago. Okay. Their staff is so global that they get to pick the best of all different countries. Yes. So that's what we have at Mass General. I am, I am glad to hear that perspective of it as far as the endless opportunities. It doesn't negate that there's still some struggles and some room to grow. Um, I talked to Jose and McDowell about the power across the black and brown diaspora. Um, you shared an article with me a few days ago about what the Smithsonian right. is attempting to do with honoring Latin culture, and there is this backlash. Um, can you talk to how important it is for black and brown people to come together, not just in political power, but wherever? Yeah. But, but so here's the thing, right? The backlash is not coming from whites or blacks. It's coming from other Latinos. And that was the part that I just, I saw and kind of picked up and I'm like, really, but go ahead and break it down even Well, more. here's what it is, is I've been saying this. We come in all different shades of color. Yes. And we come from all different ideology. I can get a room in here full of Latino Republicans like that. I can get a room full of Latino progressives like that. And then I can get a whole stadium full of Latino moderates, right? Because Latinos come from all different walks of life. They've had all different experiences. And they have all different ideological ranges. So in, that, in, in the Smithsonian Institute, um, flack is some Latinos feel that that museum is only focusing on the challenges and the difficulties. And, and they're not why. focusing on the amazing achievements of Latinos, the amazing accomplishments, and the amazing amount of Latinos who love this country and actually love this country even more than their own country. Mm -hmm. Because this country has given them the opportunity that they didn't have in their country before. So the narrative is different when you get into different shades of, of black and brown. I can never equate the Latino um, struggle in the United States with the black. Yep. It's, it's completely different. Yep. And anybody that and came five versa. years ago to Boston, they don't know the history of Boston. So they see Boston as a city that welcomes Latino athletes, Afro-Latino athletes. Yep. You know, who are the faces of the Red Sox? dark-skinned Dominicans, right? That is something that wasn't the case 30 years ago. So when you get here five years, you know, if you're a Latino, you're like, this is the greatest city in the world. This, this, this city um, supports diversity because of where we are now as opposed to where we were. So it's very, very interesting. I'm going to go back and ask you in a couple of minutes to talk about the future, but um, you said similar to what Jose said, that similar with all uh, uh, communities and cultures and that ethnicities, we are not a monolith. And so you can't just presume because someone identifies as being Latinx or Hispanic, their political affiliation, their religious belief, that they're automatically gonna prefer a particular food or whatever. Yeah. Um, let's go into the conversation about where do you see Latin Boston, Hispanic Boston in the next five years. Oh yeah, well, see, here's the thing, right? When you talk about the Latino community, not only are you talking about a wide range of different nationalities of different experiences, now you're talking about generations. The old, you know, Jose Maso represents a genera my father's generation, and they were the trailblazers. Wait a minute, hold on, hold on, wait a minute. <laughs> I thought you was going to mess with him. He, we're about the same age, though. Who? You and I. No, no, but Jose Maso and my father. Yeah, I was saying you and you I. You and I are the same next age. generation, okay. right? I, it's so hard to believe that you were saying that he's like with your dad's generation. Oh, yeah, he, 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 yeah he's from my dad's generation. So he's, his experience in Boston, like Sorry. the Tony Molina and the Alberto Versailles and the Maria Sanchez and the on and on and on, was different than mine. And it's going to be way different than my daughter, Alex, who just graduated from Emerson College. She sees Boston as... Wow, what an endless, endless opportunity, opportunities, yes, yes. right? So it is different when you talk about Latinos. And we do a, uh, an event called Latino 30 Under 30. Mm -hmm. All Latinos under the age of 30 of them, um, under the age of 30. And, and you know what, Jimmy? Almost all of them's primary language is English. They consume their media in English. And the struggle is for them to keep their Spanish. So they are, by almost every definition, American. As American as their black counterpart or their white counterpart or their Jewish counterpart. So when you talk about the Latino community, you almost have to break it down into generations too because my daughter is now second generation. 
It's interesting that you say generations because I, if you notice in the email, I, I'll be honest, uh, you saw that I was fluctuating between Hispanic and Latinx because, and I asked McDowell about that earlier, what is the preference, what is you know, going on? And she even said that it depends on the, morally it depends on the generation. Yeah. It's individual, but it depends on the generation. Yeah. Where with you, just your perspective of, of the word Hispanic versus Latinx, just out of curiosity. Yeah, no, no, and that's a great question. So, so I get, I, I'll, tell you, I'll give you three different Go answers, ahead. meaning uh, the El Mundo Boston. El Mundo's been around for 51 years. If the, we are the... Um, media outlet of record for the community. We use Latino, Latino, okay. because our readership, you know, 97% of our folks in East Boston and Chelsea, they've never heard the, word, the term Latinx. It would be completely new. It's foreign to them. It's a different, even if it's justified or not, it's just foreign. So as a media outlet, we choose Latino. Okay. Me personally, I will answer to anything. I don't get offended by anyone. You can call me Latinx. You can call me Puerto Rican, and I'm not even Puerto Rican. I'm Cuban. So it's a very personal thing. Some people are much more um, conscious of it. Others, like myself, um, you call me Latino, Hispanic, Cuban American, American. Um, it's a personal thing. Um, and I think people have to understand that um, as we move forward, I like what Jose Maso says all of the time. We're humans more than anything. So when I look at that lady right there, I don't look at her as a white woman. I look at her as a fellow human being who maybe she and I are gonna connect because if she loves Michael Jackson as much as I do, we're gonna be like this. <laughs> but if she's a Yankees fan, I don't want anything to do with her. <laughs> I just wanted to shout out a couple of people that are listening to Shad and a couple of other folks were saying period. Pastor Marion said you hit the target right on the mark as far as what you were saying earlier about coming together. As we get ready to um, wrap up and folks that are here in the audience, please write your questions down on the card and give them to Annie. And also, um, if you're asking questions at home, um, please do that on YouTube and Facebook as well. And so we're going to ask you now, Alberto, to talk about um, your culture. Yep. You, def you clarified that you're not Puerto Rican, you're Cuban. And so if you were to describe your culture as a Cuban man, um, I know you said you're American. Um, let's, let's, let's talk about the joy and the familia that Migdalia and Jose talked about. Because I want to end, we have about um, eight to 10 minutes and we can, I want to close with, you know, Thaddeus calls it black joy. I want to close with Latino joy, brown joy, whatever you want to call it. I uh, let's call, talk about your culture. I am a Bostonian who happens to be from a Cuban father, an Ecuadorian mother. My daughter's mother's Dominican. My best friends are all black and Puerto Rican. Yep. And I went to high school with all Irish kids. So I think that that's what, uh, that's what it's all about, yes, having friends and family from all different ones. You know, I gave a presentation a couple of years ago on the demographics of, of everything, and I said, you know what? Forget the numbers. If there's one thing you should remember, and this was five years ago, and I did it at the, at the Federal Reserve, is that if you're not related to a Latino, you soon shit will be. And there was a gentleman, there was a gentleman in his early 60s, and he's the, uh, and I'll leave it out him, he's from the Mass, uh, Mass, uh, Mass Growth Capital Corps, he's the CEO. He said, yeah, that'll never happen. He came up to me about two months ago, Alberto, remember that thing you said? I go, I didn't believe in that. He whips out a while, he goes, look, I have a little Puerto Rican uh, grand, uh, grandkid. So it's going to happen. We're all going to be mixed. Everybody. So that's, that's the good thing. Describe Cuban culture. Oh, Cuban, Cuban culture to me, um, although I wasn't born in Cuba, um, I grew up in a household that obviously with my father being someone who escaped communism, um, I learned a lot about Cuba and its struggles. I think that 99.9% .9 of the people I come across have no idea of the Cuban narrative. We as Cubans have not done a good enough job of explaining what co living under communism or socialism is, you know, uh, especially here in Boston. People are very romantic about Castro and Che Guevara and nothing could be true. We have failed as a Cuban community to not let people know the ills and the dangers of communism and socialism. So from my Cuban side, I am very pro-democracy, pro-business, pro-capitalism. So you ask me about my Cuban, yep. I'd say that's about 90% of Cubans that you talk about. That's why, that's why they tend to be more conservative on the political spectrum, if you, if you, if you, if you analyze it. So. Let, I wanted to end on a good note with the celebratory about the culture piece, but let's talk about that and go a little bit deeper where Jose talked about uh, like black and brown folks, men, women, 
teenagers are not monoliths just because of a demographic. And so you talked a little bit before about you could fill, and I noticed you said you could fill this room with um, a bunch of conservative uh, Latinos or Latinx. You could also fill this room with a bunch of, I think you said, Democrats. But then you said you could fill a stadium with moderates. Correct. That did not skip me. Correct. And so go a little bit deeper into not being a monolith in that political piece. Yeah. Well, I just think that on a personal level, being in the media, I think that's just reflective of what's going on in this country. Both narratives hog, bo both extremes hog the narrative, yeah. and most of us tend to be in the middle, because when people ask me, and I can't say publicly whether I'm conservative, liberal, democrat, because I'm in the media, but I will say this, is I'm in the majority, which is I could be as woke as anybody else on certain things. Yeah. I could be as, as conservative on a, lo on a lot of And a lot of times I'm in the middle. So you can't put me in a, in a political box. And I think that in America and, and in today's world, that's the majority of folks. You know, you, I, I one time said, and I've changed this, by the way. It's not that I went one way. I was in a room full of, let's just call it, this one we'll do Republican, uh, Democrats. So I said, someone said, Alberto, are you a Democrat or Republican? And then I said, I know they were mostly Democrats. So because they were mostly Democrats, I did this way, but I've done it the other way. I said, well, I'll, ne I'll, I'll never be a Republican. And they all started laughing. And I go, but I'd be a Republican before I'm a Democrat. And then they Wait. all shut up. <laughs> so, so I've done that before, by the way. So I've been in a room in South Florida. I go, I'd never be a Democrat. And they start crapping. I'm like, but I'll be a Democrat before I'm a Republican. Then it shuts them up. So I'm in that middle, right? Well, I, I don't like boxes, especially when it comes to, to politics, because that's where you get the division. And Jose Maso is a mentor in many ways. Uh, not only I've tried to emulate him and have failed to dress as well as him over the years, but his philosophy on life I would it put is. him in a small list, him, my father, Louis Tiant, a couple others who for many years, I've listened to what he says, and I read everything he writes, and his, his aspect on, hum, on humanity, that we connect on a human level. Jose Malso gets along with everybody. Yep. I've always admired that about him, and he sees the good in everybody. Um, and I've tried to do the same. So I love it when Jose Malso it talks about the, the, the human race about it, because at the end, it's one, about one race, it's the human race. I, I, I wanna, I, and I keep saying this is the last question, but people know that in this, pla in this platform, it's organic, and so I feed off of your energy. Before I ask you another question in reference to humanity and the human race, um, Toy Burton, who you know from Dee Dee's Cry, said that yes, when you made the point that you're related to someone who's Latino, she said yes, I have DR and PR um, in my family. Yeah. Um, Pastor Marion said that this is so very encouraging, listening to you. When you talk about humanity, and don't forget folks, ask your questions online, also if you're here in the audience, you can see Annie write your question on the card. Um, when you talk about humanity, I cannot have you, and I couldn't go into it with Jose and McDowell, but immigration yeah. in this country right now is a very interesting subject. From the human standpoint, where would you like to see us be as a country, as human beings, whether you're a mayor, a governor, a congresswoman, a congressman, a state rep? Where would you like to see us in the vein of immigration when you talk, talk about humanity? Yeah, yeah that, well, that, that's a very complicated <laughs> subject matter, but you know, th there are a couple facts that no one can deny. We are right now in a, uh, in a crisis mode. There are people entering the country at a pace, especially cities like New York and Massachusetts. Yes. You saw what happened yep. with Governor. There, there's a saying in Spanish, no hay cama para tanta gente. You Let know me try. Say, right? um, no, not my house, comma. No, no, there's not enough beds for, for the people. For, okay. for, for every, there's not enough beds for everybody. It's almost the kind of thing, right? So we are encountering a wave of folks who are co coming here and we're not ready. We don't have the resources, yeah. right? And then we have, which I'm glad we got undocumented now who can um, um, uh, get their licenses and yes. in-state tuition. Yes. Then we have a whole generation of folks who've been here contributing as much or more no, contributing. Yep, yep. Contributing yep. because, you know, the economy of the United States would be on the floor right now if it wasn't for these folks, yes, right? Yep. They're doing the jobs and they're working this, uh, so many different jobs of other folks and they contribute, they pay taxes. Um, they, they are the next generation. Um, the United States, the, Boston, put it this way. Let me give you this, this statistic, which if any, if, if any Bostonian wants to take one statistic away, since Larry Bird was rookie, remember Larry Bird, 1980, 19, 1980? 92% of the growth of this city is due is, to Latinos. 
92%. Okay. So could you imagine how much representation the state would have lost? What would Boston look like without 92% of its growth? From grants to, to, to funding to everything. Small the businesses yes, yes. to consumers to every aspect of our society, of our city, yes. housing, etc. So this influx of immigration is difficult because it's a national problem. Yep. This is something that's been kicked down the, key, down the road by every single president in my lifetime. Yep. Everyone, from Bush to Obama to Clinton to now Trump to now Biden. We as a country have to have um, national immigration policy, and then we have to take care of those who are here from a realistic point of view and a humanitarian point of view. That, and we're, we're getting ready to wrap up. That's one of the things I noticed that came up here within Massachusetts. Some advocates and nonprofits were like, and uh, you know, uh, uh, applauding our governor for accepting and doing you know, what she needs to do from a human standpoint, but similar to your point, folks are like, hey, wait a minute, we've had people that have been living here with housing issues. Oh, yeah. We've had, and so as you said, it is a complex it, issue, it, but I had to ask you about it from a human it, standpoint. Yeah. because. And it's a valid one, Jimmy, because I hear it every day on the show, La Hora del Café, where you have Latinos. You know, we have a push now to get um, work permits for, um, I don't forget the number, Venezuelans who have just been here. I've heard from other Latino groups, Latino groups, who've been waiting patiently for their work permit and have done it the right way. Yep. I'm not saying that the, the Venezuelans did it the right way because they were a victim of what's going on um, in their own country, but now have arrived and now they've kind of jumped the line, so to speak. In, in getting their stuff. So it's a very complicated one. Then you have the humanitarian part that it, and that's, it, it's very difficult. That's very the difficult. piece. I wanted you talk about humanitarian. I want to bring it more on a local level. Um, I want to, as I think we have a couple of minutes left. Don't forget if you have questions online for Alberto or I, um, uh, ask them right now. But two questions. One is, in this space, you and I know that when we cover certain stories, not at the level that you do, you don't just turn the mic off and go home. These things, some, the people's stories and lives sometimes stay with you. What do you do for self-care? Oh, I have a lot of fun. Oh, man, I have... He look, didn't skip I, a beat. He listen, was ready. <laughs> listen, I enjoy every minute of life. Jose Master knows. So I like going out. You okay. will see me at La Fabrica tomorrow night plug for La Fabrica. La Fabrica is a great spot in, in Cambridge where every kind of people come together because I love to dance. Okay. Okay. Love going out there hearing music, sports. I'm a huge Sox fan, movies. And as I said, whenever I need to chill out, I put rock with you, Michael Jackson. All night. Okay. And then I'll put a little Prince, a little Whitney Houston. I'm 80s. And then I could go way back R&B to SOS band. That might be before your time, no, Jimmy. the SOS band and the Gap band and all of yeah. them. Yeah. Okay. And we hear Howard over there laughing. <laughs> and Jose is too. A little um, Charlie Wilson, Howard. <laughs> watch out there now. Um, in the vein of self-care, this may take you by surprise, but a couple of years ago, there was, um, this next month will be, um, uh, a couple of years ago, there was a young lady who was tragically killed yeah. um, by the last name of uh, Minus. And Teresa Minus, um, from the Minus family, says, El Mundo serves the community as a whole. I hold a very special place in my heart for them as they reached out for comfort to me and my family during a very difficult time. And so, Alberto, I don't even know if you know sometimes the impact that you are having on community. She's sitting watching and really just appreciates the fact that you all reached out. Um, this was, the, I don't want to go into too much detail, but the Minus family on Thanksgiving, the young lady had just had a baby and she was tragically taken away from us. And so they want to thank you for being um, uh, El Mundo and you being available to them. Well, uh, the, here's the big thing, right? That's what, that's what I want you to continue, right? You need to do this. Look, you have a great staff here. Like, I love this setup, man. You, you've got some of the best people in the business. That guy's been doing it for 31 years. She, I mean, we ha you have this great setup. I'm looking at this. And listen, you've got a future in this young man. Yes, you've done this without a script. You're just doing off the cuff. You do it with a script? I've used scripts. And I, I mean, we got scripts. bullets. Thank God for Annie and the yeah, yeah, but <laughs> I know you don't need it. Thank you're you. great. You, so, so keep doing what you are because that text from that family should inspire you. I, it, it obviously, uh, I, I'm very thankful for that family to, to, to say that um, because that says, you know, you, you've done some good things yes. and you want to continue. But that's the kind of stuff that you want. That's the kind of positive impact that we in the media can have. And sometimes we forget about it. That's why this initiative, this may not be journalism in its purest form, 
But I think it's just as important. You know, we have a mind and we have a heart. Jimmy Java is the heart of GBH, ladies and gentlemen. You're going to get me in trouble. Um, let's give Alberto Vasayo, because I am big on last names. Let's give him another hand, this mentor to me. I just, I just told, um, I just told Annie, I said, I need tissue because coming from him um, as, as someone that uh, along with Jose, Jim Boyd and others, for him to allude to the fact that um, um, not taking the mantle because he's, he isn't giving it up yet, but I got to meet Jim Boyd um, a few months Sorry. ago. Um, it means a lot to me. Impact. He said the word impact. Yes. And so um, I want to appreciate those that have an impact on this space here with me. And I would like to thank, of course, uh, Migdalia, Jose and Alberto as well. Let's give them another hand for being here. Thank you. I want to thank the Newsfeed Cafe. I'm here at BPL keeping us fed and hydrated. I want to thank Lee Hill, who is actually in the building um, today, who is here. Pam uh, Johnston, Sandra Lopez-Burke, Tina Cassidy. I want to thank the GBH production team. We refer to Howard, Bill Francis, Brad, hey. and Cullen. Um, more folks in the back at GBH. Also to my producers, um, Evelyn Brito, and also Annie Scheffler, who is here. Um, and to the Davis system, we can keep clapping. Yes. Anthony, Anissa, and of course the Mother's Board, um, who uh, is here active on uh, the chat as well. Thank all of you. Please plan to join us next month. I believe the date is October 18th um, at 12 p.m. And as October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, we're going to have some survivors with us. We're going to talk about some resources that are available. And we're going to talk about, from a mental health perspective, sometimes the depression and anxiety that comes along with being diagnosed with breast cancer and we are adamantly looking to talk with a male who has been diagnosed with Brett's cancer. Join us next month for Java with Jimmy here at GBH. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you.